Hi family. I'm very excited about today's video, or today's lesson I should say, uh, for the reason that it is two part. And uh, there's two things that the Lord has kind of put on my heart and in the most odd way, they come together to formulate this beautiful picture. So we're gonna, I always like to say, we're gonna take a journey today, but really we're just gonna have a conversation. I wanna talk with you like, like the Lord talks to me, like a friend would converse with a friend. And uh, before we begin, the Lord really put on my heart to ask you to just inhale and exhale. You know, there's worries that you came, you know, with before this video started playing. There's things on your heart that concern Him, that concern your future, that concern a decision that needs to be made. And in this place, uh, he just wants you to breathe and just rest. And so every time I begin to feel anxious or I'm worried or I'm nervous or I feel like I need direction from God and he's not giving it to me, the next best thing I can do is breathe. And I asked the Lord, I was like, why do you want me to ask them to breathe in and breathe out? And he said, because I want them to understand that as they breathe me in, they are inhaling oxygen, the thing I created. And as such, I am in the thing that they breathe. I also created their lungs. In the act of doing this, it rests our souls. The Lord has been speaking to me a lot about quieting my soul. And essentially our soul is what our mind, our will, and our emotions. Sometimes those things are so loud that it's not that He's not speaking to us, but we have to quiet the things that speak louder in order for us to really come into oneness with Him. And so every time I feel anxious, I breathe in, I breathe Him in and I breathe him out. And in that exercise, I'm becoming very cognizant of the fact that when he gives me breath, it is a miracle. Somewhere along the way, I don't know, understand, you know, the, ad the anatomy of the body well, but our lungs are filled with him and they exhale him. In the exhaling of him, he is going out into our atmosphere. It's more of a consciousness of that he, uh, a more of a consciousness that he is within you and around you. And as we breathe, it is a reminder to quiet our soul. And so um, I don't know what it is you might be dealing with, or maybe you have come to this place and you already are full of rest. It's still something so good to do that brings us to remembrance of the God that we serve and the God who loves us. And so I encourage you just to breathe in and just be here. Anything that you're worried about is already taken care of. You are on a road to walk that out. The Lord already has provision for you. He already has the next step for you. Anything that you are unaware of, you do not need to know in this moment. And the Lord is faithful to remind you and to guide you to that answer. And so in this place, I'm always reminded that He is constantly bringing us to a state of rest. Rest equals trust and trust equals faith. And that is the thing that pleases God. And so anytime I can take an opportunity to rest in Him, I am reminded of the fact that He wants to increase my faith. And resting in is active. We've talked about that in other videos. It's not just about doing nothing. Even in a season of waiting, the Lord is pre preparing you in that waiting. So you're not just not doing anything. There's preparation that's happening. But in everything that He does, it is always to for us to encounter Him and to bring us to a place of trust in who He is. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. The battle we're going to be talking about is, I'm sure you guys have read the title by now, it's The Battle of And God Said. And I hope that this piques your curiosity because it piqued mine. When the Lord gave me the title, I was like, what is this possibly about? And it wasn't until two or three days later that he revealed to me what this actually meant. And so before we dive into that, of course, you're going to pray. Um, but before we do that, there's one thing I want to communicate to you. Um, the Lord has shown me in this last week that His children, and, and again, this was a lesson for me that I want to communicate to you, put this on my heart to share with you, that He has called us to do things. And there's many times in life where, where we lose and misplace the focus on doing, and we focus on the perfection of that doing. He tells us, I want you to you know, wake up earlier with me in the morning. I want you to stop watching that Netflix show and spend more time with me. I want you to go love on that person. I want you to give of yourself in this way. So now it's about finances. Uh, he says, I want you to fast. Anytime the Lord asks me to go into a fast with him, I automatically, everything in me is like, God, I don't want to do this. I love food, y'all. 
Like I love food. And so to think of going a period of time without food, I understand the Lord is bringing me on into an understanding of why he does that. But so many times the Lord told me this literally this morning that our, our need as his children is disguised in his command. And I was like, what? what does that even mean? And he said, Deanna, there's many times in your life, every time I ask you to do something, it looks like it is in the form of a command. And where you misplace the focus in your humanity is that you focus on the perfection of walking out the thing I've asked you to do. Now, there's something that is is very important about obedience. And I think in Christian culture, the Lord has shown me in my quiet time that yes, obedience is important, but he is not a God that sits off to the side watching how well you obey or, obey or not. Seeing if you perfect every little detail that he's called you to, there's something on the other side of that obedience that he wants you to walk into. And every time the Lord asks us to do something, it's not just for the sake of Oh, she listened to me this time. Good. Now I'll bless her with more things. She was obedient here. It, we think that it stops with obedience, but there's something on the other side of that obedience that is for us that we don't see because we're so focused on the command. And just this week, the Lord asked me to do something and I started doing it. And in my doing it, I've started to feel like I was failing, like I had messed up, like I wasn't doing it right. And, it, and then, then I started to experience feelings or emotions of guilt and shame. And if I can't even do this right, then how, how could the Lord possibly use me in this way? If I can't perfect, you know, this thing that he's asked me to do, I'll never be able. One, uh, one of the things the Lord always has to remind me is that when, when things like never and guilt and things that aren't of him start to speak to me, I immediately can stop myself and say, this is not of God, but where is this coming from? Is it my shame? Is it my guilt? Something is, is coming to speak against the truth of who he is, which causes a natural separation in my relationship with him. And so he's, I, I, I believe he's building that spirit of discernment within his children to stop coming to him from this place of guilt or shame, perfection, even in the space of obedience. And I asked myself, okay, how can I be obedience without, obedient without carrying the shame of messing this thing up? The only reason we experience shame is, is because we are fearful of rejection from our father. And so when that comes on, we have to understand that we are never rejected by him. But what is it that I'm missing? And he said, Diana, anytime I ask you to do a thing, whether it's to go love on someone, whether it's to go read in the morning, whether it's to release a relationship, whether it's to start something new, the first and foremost thing that is important that I want you to understand is that there is something of me that you need to encounter. The Lord showed me this, this picture of, of his pursuit of us and that, and I'm going to get to <laughs> all of this stuff, but this is what he wanted me to start with. But the Lord showed me this picture in his pursuit of us that, that we think we're so conditioned to thinking that in relationship with him, you, you think of a, a relationship or a friendship or dating or marriage, we're so conditioned to think that you pursue and you pursue and, and you pursue until you get that thing. And once you get that thing, you stop pursuing. And we have taken that same you know, misconstructed view and place that on our relationship with the Lord, where we think, and we've also been taught to a certain degree that once, you know, the Lord is constantly pursuing us. And once he has our attention, the relationship is all then about him, us seeking him. And it becomes this hyper focus of us doing it right and perfecting it right and making sure we're showing up right. And we com we completely dismiss, and I say we because the, just this morning the Lord had to remind me of this, that I completely forgot that the Lord is constantly still pursuing me and that in his command, my need is disguised. What does that mean? That when he tells me, Diana, go on a three-day fast with me, and I decide to focus on whether I'm perfecting the fast, right? Okay, I need to make sure I have all my ducks in a row so that I hear from him. If I don't hear from him, I won't understand what to do next. And then he won't be pleased with me. And then I, I won't be able to experience promise. All these things that haven't even happened yet. We, 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 but, but it begins with the focus on what we need to do. And he said, Diana, when I call you into a fast, I first want you to encounter me because I see that you have need of me. And isn't that so beautiful how the Lord is still pursuing us in his command? You can look through all throughout scripture. And as I start reading, I see even where the, the Lord will tell Elisha to go to a place. But in that going, there's provision that's for him there. Elisha, Elijah could have gotten stuck on how to go. Where, when do I go? Which way do I go? But the Lord said, you have need of something 
You have need of something that is true about me. Sometimes the Lord will tell us to do something. And in us doing that, he wants us to know. How can I say this? Lord, help me. When the Lord tells us to do something, I'll give you an example. He calls me, for example, he calls me into a fast. I freak out over perfecting the way that I fast so that I can receive things from the Lord. But the Lord needed, wanted me to go on a fast so that he could overwhelm me with his love. He drew me out and said, I want you to specifically over these next couple of days, take time with me intentionally, not so that you could perfect a thing, but because I see that you have need of me. I want you to eliminate watching that show because I see that you have need of me. We get busy with all of the to-dos that the Lord has asked us to do, but our, 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 in our humanity, our limited you know, way of thinking stops with the command. And he said, no, Diana, as your father, I see that you have need of me. And sometimes my coming to your rescue comes in the form of a command. I do not want you to focus, hyper-focus on the perfection of walking and what I've asked you to do because you're going to fail and I already knew that. And it's not even about the failing. It's about me teaching you as you go. But even more importantly, as you do that thing that I've asked you to do, I see that there is need of something in your life from me. You see how, how, how amazing that is that we think God asks us to do something so that we can give to him, so that we can perform for him, so that we can be something in the world, even to others. And he says, no, you have it twisted. It's not that that doesn't come after the fact, but first and foremost, I want you to know, I want you to be sure of who I am. Sometimes the Lord will remind us of who he is through a command. He'll, he'll give us guidance and provision. Wow. That, that looks like obedience is, is, the, is the main factor. And it's not that that isn't a part of it, but in our obedience, he's also saying, I'm, a God who, I'm the God who is on time. I see that you need something of me before you can utter something out of your mouth or before you can get to a place where you're so defeated and discouraged. I'm coming to you beforehand and I'm saying, there's something that's coming in your life and you have a need of who I am. You need to understand who I am. You need to understand my love for you. And so in that way, I will ask you to wake up early and spend time with me. In that way, I will ask you to release a relationship that is blocking your need for me. God, you're so good. And so he had to remind me of this and, and it just shifted my complete perspective on anything that the Lord asked me to do. That yes, it is about my obedience, but that my obedience unlocks a level of fullness in him because he sees that there's something within his child that the Lord is proactive. And that is his pursuit of us. I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've been told, even in, in Christian community, and this is not to downplay what is taught in the church. We have to become a people who are hungry to know the Lord for the truth, for, for who he is outside of even a pulpit or even, you know, the four walls of a building. And so there was something in me that every time the Lord would ask me to do something, I, I wondered why I always struggled with this, this shame of not being able to do it right. Any time that, that that arises within me, it is a direct call for me to reflect on my perspective of how I view the situation. And in my reflecting, the Lord just opened up this beautiful picture that no, Diana, it, it is not about what I ask you to do. Yes, there is promise in what I ask you to do. Yes, there is, there is, you know, fullness in that it, that comes in the form of your obedience. But it was never about perfection of you doing it right or wrong. The Lord gave me this example about my son, and He said, Diana, in, even in the way that you tell Kai to go to bed at eight o'clock, you tell him to go to sleep because you know that he has need of rest for what is coming. The school, you know, it, it was a, a period of time where school, we were transitioning. This is beautiful. We were transitioning. We're going to talk about this today. From a period of summer to a period where he was in school, he was able to be more free and carefree and, and stay up late and do the things he wanted to do. But as his mother, the Lord showed me as his mother, I saw that there was a season of preparation that, had to, to, that was coming. So in my knowing that he's going to have to start waking up at 6.45 every morning, I need to prepare him in the weeks ahead because he has a need of something. Look at it like this. In, and the Lord explained it to me in this way. 
in him granting, in me granting the, the need that my son has, that is a way that he finds safety in me. It is a command that I gave him. To him, it will look like, this is so good, it will look like I'm saying, go to bed early. I'm stealing his fun from him. I'm telling him he can't do something. I'm placing restriction or limitation on him. But it, I, am, I am giving him that command because he has the need of something on the other side of his obedience to that command. And in that follow through, he can rest in the fact that my mom has got me. Wow, I feel rested today. He might not notice it as an eight-year-old boy, but in him, in him growing up, when I, com- when I continue to do these things, the Lord, you are so faithful. that he shows us that he he cares for us and he provides for us before the fact. It might come in the, in the space of a command, but in that, in that command, he's communicating so many more things to us that, that he sees what's coming and I want you to be prepared, that I want you to know that I have your back and it might feel like I'm restricting you or I'm restraining you, but in this command, I have your best interest at heart because I see that you have need of something, that you need to be reminded of who I am. Wow. Every, at every turn in my relationship with the Lord, He is always altering my view of Him. And so many times I, I get frustrated. Any, a, a clear indication of frustration in your relationship with the Lord could be a moment where you need to sit back and reflect and say, God, I'm frustrated in this environment. It could be because of the way I view what you've asked me to do. It could be because of the way I view you. It could be because of the way I view myself. What is the truth of the matter in this situation? Who are you really? Do I need to shift my perspective? Am I walking through life from a broken system? And he's faithful to do that. And so in him reaffirming me, in his command to me a couple of days ago, the Lord said, I want you to share this with my children. Because there's some of you guys that he's asked you to do something. And you've been frustrated by the command. And you think that your life is just, it feels like a bunch of instruction. Everything feels like God's telling me to do this, but I can't do it right. And he's not pleased with me and that I won't. All these things that you're telling yourself that have not happened yet. That is not how the Lord sees you. And he says, no, everything that I ask you to do, everything, every instruction or guidance that I give you is all about the fact that you have need of something and that I want to show you the truth of who I am. It is all about his pursuit of us. He never stops pursuing us. He never stops. I hope that I communicated that well. Okay. Now, (laughs) that wasn't even a part of what I actually planned to talk about today. Um, Like I said, the battle that we're going to be talking about today is the battle of and God said. And these two, I cannot communicate how well these two tie in together. And I did not see the order of this literally until this moment, actually, as I'm sitting here with you guys now. I love this space because I get to learn and experience the Lord just as you guys are through me and through this time. But I mentioned in the Undoing community, and that's just a, another place for believers to celebrate one another in our undoing, but also to encounter the Lord for ourselves. Uh, the Lord has put it on my heart that there is a passion and a people who just want to know who He is. And that is, is, can be disguised in many ways, but the root of the purity of our heart is to come into oneness with our Father. Sometimes we don't always communicate that expressively and outwardly in the right way. Sometimes tradition has told us to do it a certain way, but the heart of His people want to know who He is. And so that is what the Undoing community is about. And I mentioned there uh, just yesterday that today's video would be about the story of Ruth. And the Lord has guided me to this place and and... I read it the first few times reading the the book of Ruth before. It's a very short book. It's only four chapters long. Um, But there's something so special that the Lord opened my eyes to that I want to, that I want to, that I know applies to you. And I say that in every video, but I say that with confidence and that this is not one of those feel good messages that's going to carry you on to the next. This applies to every child of God, every believer in him. 
It might do it differently than another believer, but it is for the one that believes in God. And so I'm going to pray before we start that the Lord would soften our hearts, that he would give me the words to say that I would be composed in my communication because he consistently wrecks me. Um, but I think that's beautiful even still. Okay, let's pray. Oh, Lord, I thank you for this place. You've already done so much. Honestly, we could stop the video now and what has already been communicated, what has already been said is more than I could have ever asked for. I thank you that you always remind me of your love for me. I thank you that it is a thing that grounds us and it keeps us and it breaks every chain. Even though we might not see how it connects, Father, there is connection in your love. It is the thing, that, the way that you move. It is the expression of who you are. And we thank you for that communication. I thank you for what is happening here, what has already happened, the peace that has already been established in the heart of the one that is watching right now. I pray that you would plant that seed deep within them. I pray that they would take what they hear back to you in their quiet time with you. I pray that they would not use me as a caveat to get to you, help them to understand that the exact way that you speak to me, that you speak to them in that way, that they have access to the Holy Spirit and he can guide them into all truth, that they don't need another person to know you. I pray that you would bless this place, that you would multiply it, that those whose heart it touches, that they would share it with a friend, that this place would be a house of rest in you. I thank you for all that you are, for the sacrifice of Jesus, for the gift of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would bless this time, that you would multiply it. For the glory of who you are and for us, that our true identity would be revealed in you. In your name I pray, amen. All right, guys, I'm going to try and get through this the best that I can. <sighs> okay, so like I mentioned earlier, uh, this battle, this war, we've been talking about the war within, okay? And a lot of the things that we face as believers, the Lord has opened my eyes to, to in my own personal life, that a lot of the war that I face are mental battles that don't necessarily have to do with the enemy. And it's not that he's not a part of it. It's not that he's not involved, but it's that I already have the victory over him. And so if I'm in a place where I'm still constantly facing battles, the Lord is bringing his children to a place where they gather understanding and they walk in the wisdom of who he is that allows us to overcome these wars within that we face. And so today, the battle that we're going to be talking about is the battle of and God said. And this is going to be displayed over the book of Ruth. And so I want to give you guys a little bit of backstory. We're going to read the first chapter of Ruth, but I encourage you to read this book. Even if you want to pause it, read the whole thing through right now. It's only four chapters and come back, then do so. But even if you just want to listen through uh, now, I encourage you to read this book in your time. Okay. And so I'm going to start by just reading the first chapter and we're going to, we're going to roll, roll with the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would guide me in this time. All right, so we're reading in Ruth chapter 1. It says, Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of, of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of the two sons were, I'm going to try and pronounce this, Malon and Chilion. I don't know if that's right. Ephra, Ephra, Ephrites, Jeez, Jesus help me. Ephrathites, Ephrathites, maybe, of Bethlehem, Judah. And they went to the country of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died there. Then Elimelech, it says, oh, I read that twice. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. Now they took two wives of the women of Moab. The names of one was Orpha, and the other was Ruth. And they dwelt there about ten years. Then both Malon and Chile, Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose talking about Naomi with her daughter-in-law, daughters-in-law, that she might return to the country of Moab, for she had heard that she might return from the country of Moab, excuse me, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. 
in the land of Judah, Bethlehem, where they had came from, where they traveled from. Therefore, she went out from that from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law were, were and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return to each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and they lifted up their voices and wept. <laughs> That's interesting. And they said to her, Surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them until they were grown? Would you wait for them? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, Look, Naomi talking to Ruth, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Gods with a little g, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. I do not want to leave you or to turn back from following you. From wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also. If anything but death parts you and me, there is a covenant happening here with her words. When she saw that she was determined, talking about Naomi, saying that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. <laughs> now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. We're going to come back to that. And the women said, is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of barley harvest. Okay, so I wanna give you guys a little bit of backstory. Now, these people, Ruth, omit Ruth from the story just yet. There's Naomi, there's Elimelech, and there's the two sons, okay? They are of the tribe of Judah, which was of 12 tribes, which were of the Israelites, okay? God had brought the Israelites to the promised land, and in the promised land, he had given them instructions. They divide themselves into 12 regions, 12 tribes, and one of those tribes are the tribe of Judah. Now, if you go back, the book of Deuteronomy talks a lot about the Lord's communication. There was this period of waiting before the Israelites entered into the promised land. There was a lot of instruction, a lot of beware, a lot of mind yourselves, a lot of remember what I've told you, a lot of instruction and the fullness of that instruction and what would happen in their, in their disobedience. One of the things the Lord communicates to them is he says that when you go into the land, do not yoke yourselves, do not come in a covenant with the people that I am calling you to drive out, saying to them that I am calling you to be separate. I am not moving you into this land, into this promised land for you to join with the people. And we'll see as we continue reading uh, throughout Joshua and really judges how the tribes did start to, some of them, they drove the people out. Some of them, they didn't, and they remained there. And then they started taking them as wives and started replicating, you know, more children and having babies. And as I was reading this, I asked the Lord, I was like, why was it so important for them not to join with the people that, that, that God had calls them, called them to? remove from the promised land. And he said, Diana, the thing that I wanted them to, to stay true to was that my wisdom of what I had done in the past would remain in the promised land as they began to unite themselves with other people and other gods and other ways and create more children. The generations would continue to forget what I had done. I wanted them to remain true in the, the place that I had called them and, and, and tell the generations to come that hadn't seen us walk through the Red Sea and come into the promised land of what the Lord had done. But we see here that, uh, just giving you guys a bit of backstory, in the book right before Ruth, 
it says the literally the last verse in Judges 20, what is it? 21, 25. It says in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. For so long, the Israelites had been a people who were used to following the command of one person. You have Moses, then you have Joshua, then you have judges, different judges that were ruling about that time. And it still says that in the book of Ruth, it says now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled, but there was not one centralized person that the word of the Lord came through that that was then dispersed among the people. And so as any cultural any culture might do, you begin to do the best that you know how with, with what you know. And it says in scripture that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so as I was studying, before we even get into Ruth, like the, the her story, there's this transition that is happening in the Bible that I want to talk about in this transition that's happening among the Israelites where they have now entered the promised land. They have divided themselves between the tribes, the land that the Lord has called them to occupy. They are occupying that land. Elimelech, who is uh, Ruth's father-in-law, and Naomi were of the land of Judah. And there was a famine that came in the land. Now, I, the, the thing that the Lord began to show me was that anywhere that he has called us, that does not mean that, that you, you think of promised land where there's always going to be, you know, overflow. But somewhere along the way, there was a famine. Maybe Elimelech and Naomi stopped trusting God. And I'm not, you know, blaming them for the reason why they picked up their home and moved to Moab, which was a country outside of where God had called them to a people outside of who God had called them to. But maybe perhaps the famine, you know, aroused a fear in them. They said, well, let's go to a new place where there's provision. So uh, Elimelech picks up his family and they go move to this new place. I find it interesting that as they go to this new place, he dies, Elimelech dies, and the sons die. Now, both of the sons decided to marry women who were not of the people that God had called them to. They were not of the tribe of Judah. They weren't uh, one of the 12 tribes of Israel. They were of the Moabite people, which were outside of God's chosen people. Okay. And so you, you see this thread here from Deuteronomy to Ruth, where the Lord communicates covenant to his people. The people say, we will do as the Lord says. And over time of transition, they begin to forget the word of the Lord. Now, judges have to be, there's so many times where the Israelites do something and then the Lord will you know, raise Gideon and then he'll raise another judge, Deborah, to guide them back to him. And then they fall to their ways again. It's like this transition where they were used to being led by one person and that no longer happens anymore. We see the rise of, of uh, Samuel as a prophet of the Lord come and the people declare for a king and then they want Saul and then they want David. But there's this transition that happens, okay? And I don't want to get ahead of myself, but there's this, there's this, there's this, how can I communicate this Lord? Something happens where Elimelech and his family just make a, a conscious decision to move out of the place that the Lord has called them to. And because of that, I'm not, I, I wasn't there, so I can't say that this is what happened, but this is what the Lord put on my spirit. My, uh, uh, Naomi, when she hears that the Lord revisits his land, the land of Judah with bread, she says, okay, well, now it's time to go back. But in her going back, she left full and comes back empty. There's something that happens in verse 19. It says, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem after, this is when Naomi is returning back with Ruth. It says, all the city was excited because of them. That indicates that Naomi was well-known. Elimelech, maybe he was well-known. If all of the city, it says all, anytime the Lord, the scripture uses the word all and every, it's something to pay attention to. It's, it's a, a key into uh, a deeper perspective. But it says all the city was excited because of them. She communicates to them, do not call me Naomi because I'm not returning the same way that I came. But she has someone with her. I want to talk to you guys about the battle within that we face of, and God said. Now, the Lord told me a while ago to start reading at the beginning of the Bible. And I know this probably sounds all over the place, but hang in there with me because there is massive revelation that we're going to uncover. 
But in the beginning, the Lord told me, uh, really around about two, three months ago, the Lord said, I want you to start reading the Bible from the beginning. From, from, for a long time, I had just kind of like peace read the Bible. I would read something and pick and, you know, choose things. But he said, Diana, in order for you to understand what was happening, you need to read it from, from the beginning. And so I started reading in the beginning. Now, Ruth is a pivotal book. And I say that because the Lord opened my eyes to this. The Lord is talking constantly from Genesis all the way up until Ruth. Ruth is the first book in the Bible where we see this transition where there is no voice of the Lord. There is no, and God said, you can read it for yourself. There's nowhere in time where an angel comes and visits or a prophet comes and says something to someone or someone has this magical transformative moment that, that is a direction and guidance for the next place. But in all of the books preceding that, Genesis through Judges, there are several accounts where you see, and God said, and the Lord said, and the angel of the Lord said. There's so many things, that, but, but we come to Ruth, and it would appear that, that God was silent. And I said, I, I started to flip to the next chapter, and if you, you go to the next book, and it is immediately dealing with Samuel. Well, we know God spoke in Samuel because he communicates to Samuel to talk to Eli about what was going to happen. And so it, it, it seems like there's this pause in the Bible, just in the book of Ruth, and there's no and God said. And so as I was reading Ruth, I began to ask the Lord, why was there this pause here? What, the Lord is always intentional. And this wasn't something that I just noticed on my own, you know, accord. I was reading it and the Lord brought to my attention, there's no record of and God said in this book. And again, here we see another transition in the Bible. I thought it was interesting. I wrote down, we all deal with the frustration about hearing the voice of God, hearing him correctly. The Lord keeps reminding me to look at what is being produced in my life when it comes to him. This is, a, this is something, just a good rule of thumb for you to use in your life that the Lord has shown me. Anytime, and I said this earlier, when it comes to relationship with Him, what is produced from what is happening? Is fear produced when the Lord asks me to do something or I feel like He's silent? Is worry, uh, does worry come up? Am I, am I filled, with, filled with anxiety? What is produced in my life when it comes to Him? Not hearing from Him sometimes produces fear at times. Needing extra confirmations causes anxiety at times. Then there's people who know that he talks to other people, but feel like he feels like he won't talk to them, which makes us feel less than. I wrote down all of those feelings associated are not of God. How do I know that? Fear is the root. Anxiety is not being accepted by God. Anxiety and, and that shame that is attached is the fear of rejection by God, not being good enough to hear from Him, which produces fear. Yet, the Lord brought me to Ruth. Nowhere in the Bible, in this book of Ruth, does it say, and God said. Nowhere do we read where there was a recollection of His voice of direction of guidance. Nowhere do we read, even for Naomi, that an angel comes to her and says, you need to return to Judah, to the land of Bethlehem. We don't read that here. Yet, the, world, the will of God is accomplished. I want you to just think about that. We are a people and I think part of it is our conditioning. We're so conditioned to need a word from the Lord. I've experienced this multiple times in my life where I cannot move forward unless I hear God say something to me or I become crippled. Now, the dependence on God and our, the purity of our spirit is beautiful, but you have to look at what is produced from not hearing from Him. If I don't hear from Him, do, am, I, am I feeling like less than? Am I feeling fearful? Am I feeling like I, I don't have the thing that I need? Are those things of God? What is produced in this space of not hearing and God said? But we come to the book of Ruth and there is no and God said. Hmm. Ruth is the first book in the Bible where there is no and the Lord said, yet her story was that she was doing the best she could with what she knew. What did she know? I want to I want to bring something to light in this picture. At the end of Ruth, you got if you go on and read, 
we realize that Jesus is birth of her. She is a descendant of Jesus, okay? Now, if Elimelech and Naomi were of the tribe of Judah, <clears throat> but they went to Moab, their sons married, and this is how Ruth comes into the picture. What does this say about the character of God? Every time we read, and any time you read in scripture, we have to read with the lens of what is this revealing to me about the nature and the character of God? Does it say that his will will be fulfilled even if there is no and God said? Does it say that he can use a woman who was not even born of his chosen people that a miracle will be birthed through that will actually save our generation. If you like piece together those things, if there was no and God said, there was no divine wisdom that, was, that, that came down and manifested itself in the ways that we had seen God do in the, in the prior books of the Bible, yet God uses two people to go to a country that was outside of where he called them to bring back a woman And through that woman, mind you, there was no Boaz without the Ruth. You see what I'm, do you guys get the picture that I'm painting? Boaz came to know Ruth only because she married into a family of people who were supposed to be where God had called them. Could it be that we hyper-focus on needing a word from God in order to perfect his will. Could it be that God does not need to speak in order for his will to be accomplished? Could it be that the silent places of your life are not for you to fret and for me to worry because he hasn't spoken, but to trust in the fact that he doesn't have to speak for me to be exactly where I need to be, for me to gather exactly what I need to gather, for the people who need to see me, the relationships that I need to encounter to happen in the exact way that they need to encounter without him ever saying a word. I thought this was fascinating because, and this is, this is very against can, uh, I will say against Christian culture in that we are always taught that we need a word from God. And it is not that in our ignorance that we go without hearing from the Lord. It is that we are not crippled in our going if we have not heard from him. Wow. You read this story of Ruth and she is perfectly positioned to where conversations are happening behind the scenes that she's unaware of. People are watching her move and calling her a virtuous woman. And she's, she's completely unaware of what is happening. The thing that we notice about Ruth is that she has a posture. The thing that we notice about Ruth is that there's something within her that calls to the truth of God. Mind you, she, she is from Moab. These people were not from God. She encounters and marries into a family that knows of God, that is of his chosen people. It says in the first chapter, they dwelt there 10 years after she had married into this family. So there had to have been some sort of exchange between Elimelech and Naomi and Ruth and their sons to where something in her spirit was ignited, the truth of something she encountered of God through his people. Maybe it wasn't perfect, Maybe she didn't know the way of their custom. Maybe she didn't understand how to, you know, uh, appropriately uh, pray or, or come into communion with God. But there was something within her that would not return back to what she knew. What if one choice to not return back to something that you knew is what opens 
the door for God to not have to speak a word over your life. At every turn when we read in this book, she is granted what she needs. There's favor over her. There's extra left out for her. Where it seems like she lost a husband, God restores her and gives her land, and, and not just land, but also wealth. She is well known. And all of this came about because she made one choice not to return back to familiar ways. There was no angel that came down and met with her and said, go with Naomi. Do not return back to what you, there's no record of that. And it's not to say that it didn't happen, but the Lord is so intentional with his word. And I can't help but think that there's so many times in the previous books where God manifested himself in the form of an angel or spoke through a person and the word of the Lord is communicated on earth to manifest what he wanted to come to pass. Yet in the book of Ruth, there is no recollection of and God said. Yet we need that in order to move forward. I asked the Lord, what is the difference between needing and desiring his and God said or going and trusting that he actually doesn't have to speak in order for his will to be accomplished in my life? Do you under, do, I don't even think I fully grasp the magnitude of trusting in God so much that even though I desire to hear from him, that if he doesn't give me specific instructions on exactly how to do something and when to do it, that his will will still come to pass in my life. With one choice from Ruth, and this is not to over glorify Ruth. Many times when I read the Bible, I have to remember that these people were just people like I am a person. And the Lord can do miraculous things through my life, just like he did through their life. The common denominator is not the people and that we need to replicate their lives. It's that we say it, we serve and we love and we are in communion with the same God. So if he didn't have to speak a word to Ruth for her destiny to be accomplished, what does that mean for us? What does this pause in his silence in this book of Ruth communicating to us? Wow, what happens, I wrote in my notes, what happens when there has been no and God said or and the Lord said? Many of us believe that if we haven't gotten an and God said over our life, we feel we are lacking if there has been no word from God. We see others getting words from God, but what happens when you're desperately seeking him to speak, but there are no words? Most times we panic, think something is wrong with us. We get anxiety because we feel like we missed it. We start feeling less than, all of which are not from the Lord. We read the Bible through this filter and believe that things in our life can only happen if we get a word from Him. If He would just speak to us, failing to realize that we have everything we need, even in His stillness. Wow. I wrote this down. I said, Lord, I trust you and your ability to move in times and in seasons, even outside of time and season, even if it looks silent and is scary to me. The will of God was still accomplished in what we think or see as silence. We can look at this book and say, God never said anything to her. How did she know to go? How did, how did, how did she know to obey Naomi? Even if you read in chapter three, there's some wild, wild kind of weird, you know, instruction that Naomi gives Ruth as Ruth is, is uh, living in this new land. She, at one point in time, she tells him to only, you know, pick, uh, it says in verse 22, chapter uh, two, and Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is good, my daughter, that you go out with his young woman. And that you and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the, the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest. And she dwelt with her mother-in-law. There's this other portion when you go into chapter three, where there's these very interesting commands to Ruth. One of the, one of the times uh, Naomi tells her, go lay by his feet after he's had something to drink and after he's had something to eat, talking about he as in Boaz. 
This is a man whose field she has been gleaning from when the Lord has actually given provision to the people of, of Judah. She says, she says to her, go and lay by his feet, but like uncover his feet, something, something kind of along those lines. I, actually, I'm going to read it. It says in chapter three, it says, then Naomi, her mother-in-law said to her, my daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? Now, Boaz, whose young women you are with, is he not our relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. Then it shall be when he lies down. This is in chapter 3. When he lies down, that you shall notice the place where he lies. And you shall go in, uncover his feet, and lie down. And he will tell you what you should do. I read that the first time. And I was, if that was me... If I was Ruth, I would have been like, Naomi, you are suspect. This is weird. I am not about to do this. Like, it, th that doesn't make any what, Just do what he tells me to do after he wakes up and sees me laying next to his feet. Like, that is wild. Yet, her response is, all that you say to me, I will do. There's a heart posture. Wow, okay. There's a heart posture here that we see from Ruth. Again, this is not to overglorify Ruth. This is to, to show us the nature and the character of God. Without him ever giving her a word of what to do, her heart posture follows the spiritual covering that was placed in her life. Ruth has come from a place where she doesn't know the customs of the land. She doesn't know the history of the people of Israel. The closest thing she has to God is her relationship with Naomi. And in that place, her heart posture says, whatever you tell me to do in this place, I will do. Sometimes our heart posture is disguised. It is to the Lord that we say these things. Sometimes it could be in church where we, our heart posture is, Lord, whatever you ask me to do in this place, I will do it. The Lord never comes to her that night and says, this is what you need to do and this will be. And he, she never has a Mary moment where the Lord comes to Mary and says, you will carry the child. You know, you will carry Jesus and his name will be and this is what he will do. And that never happens. Her heart posture is, is thirsty for the things of God. And because of this, not because she got it right, because honestly, the command from, from Naomi was a little wild. It was suspect. It's like, why are you telling me to do this? I would have questioned it at every turn. Yet there was something in her heart that said, all that you say to me, I will do. And I believe in this space, there was something that, that, that Ruth possessed that I know that it is in our hearts. Sometimes we don't always get it right, but our heart's posture towards the Lord is all that you tell me to do, I will do it to the best of my ability. I might mess up along the way. I might fail. I might get it wrong. I might perceive you from a broken lens, God, but my heart says all that you ask me to do, I will do it. The Lord never had to come tell, come say anything to her for his will to come to pass, for Ruth to experience favor in her life, for her to literally be a descendant of the miracle that Jesus was to the earth. Yet the will of God was done through somebody who wasn't even of his chosen people. If that can happen for Ruth, how much more for you and I? We see things in the book of Ruth that says, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done, how you have left your father and your mother and your land of birth, how you have forsaken what you knew to be true in the past and you have walked into the unknown. The Lord repay your work some of us don't realize that when we turn away from what was in order to pursue what is unknown in the Lord, that that is work. We then get so hyper-focused on perfecting what comes after that. But the Lord has said, I will fully repay you. He says this to Ruth through Boaz, which is what is so crazy. How did he get a full report of everything that Ruth had done? How did he know that she had left the place of her birth, the place that was familiar to her. And it says, it says this, how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. I think so many times we don't realize that in our stepping into the unknown, we are with our 
hearts and with our bodies and with our mind and with our spirit, with our soul, performing a work that the Lord says, I will repay you a full reward for leaving what was familiar for what you knew and stepping into the unknown. What if God doesn't have to come down and manifest himself to you and say, move to this place for the will of God to be performed in your life? What if this pause on him speaking, this is so crazy. What if this pause on him speaking in the Bible is to communicate to us that you do not need a word. I do not have to speak. Even I am above the authority of what I say that I can think a thing that your story was so well written that I do not have to manifest myself in in the form of a prophetic word for you to be exactly where you need to be in the timing that you need to be there in order for the will of God to be manifested in your life. Doesn't mean that it wasn't painful. Ruth experienced loss. Her husband dies. She goes into what is unknown, what is unfamiliar. All of those things take a step of, of courage and of bravery to forsake or to leave what was once familiar and to step into a place that is completely unknown to you. He says you have sought refuge under the Lord's wings by stepping into a place that is not familiar to you. Later on in in chapter three and in verse 10, then he says, Boaz is is talking to Ruth. He says, blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning. And what you did in that, you did not go after young men, whether poor or rich. You did not, wow, dear Lord, you did not see, try and you know, find things that, that appealed to the times. She stayed. Her heart posture was to stay where her spiritual covering had told her to stay. Excuse me, gosh. Her heart posture was all that you say to me, I will do. You did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. You weren't chasing after the things that the world tells you to chase after. And now my daughter, verse 11 in chapter three, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request for all the people of my town. Know that you are a virtuous woman. I'm just like floored at the goodness of God. Just really taking that in. Have we been a people that are so conditioned to need a word from God that it cripples us out of trusting him? There's no and God said. What if, I know there's been so many periods of my life where I desire to hear from the Lord. Lord, I just want to hear from you. Whatever you tell me to do, I will do that. And in the absence of him speaking, fear started to manifest. Am I doing this right? Where all along the way I had actually been, even in the place where I felt confused, even in the place where I haven't heard from him, he was still with me because of the work I had done in forsaking what I knew in the past, not trusting in my own abilities, but stepping into the unknown, giving him another day to show up. All of this is work. We think it's work in the sight, in the the perspective of perfecting what he's called us to do. Yet he honors her work in one choice that she made. One choice to not return to what was familiar. There was no need for God to come down and say things to her because his word was manifested by the courageousness of one choice. That is beyond epic. What if the simplicity of turning away from what was yields no reason for God to speak? What if he doesn't have to speak for you to get where you need to go? What would it look like for God to never give us a word, yet our lives were walked out perfectly according to his plan? What would that look like? I want to read this to you. (laughs) He told me, Deanna, I don't use the word perfect like you do or like you would. Jesus' life resembled this. I wouldn't have called his time on earth perfect. I thought about this in the life of God, in the life of Jesus on earth. Although the work that was completed in him was perfect, it did not appear perfect from an onlooker. To me, I wouldn't have called that perfect. His family mocked him. 
The same people he healed were some of the same ones yelling, crucify him. His body was dismantled. He died a criminal's death. Yet in the eyes of our Father, it was a perfectly completed work. What does this mean for our lives? What if instead of looking for perfection, we look for the work to be complete? That is what happened in the life of Ruth. No, her story was not perfect. No, there, was not, there wasn't a moment where the Lord manifested, at least not recorded, where we can read that God gave her specific instruction for her to know not to go back to Moab and to go with Naomi, to, to, to walk out the weird instruction that her spiritual covering, Naomi, the closest thing that she knew to God, spoke to her. She probably didn't know that it was right. Probably was just as confused as the rest of us. When we read that, it sounds weird. Go lay down by a man's feet, and then when he wakes up, do what he tells you to do. We get commands like that from God sometimes that make no sense. But her heart said, all that you say, I will do. It's not like Ruth knew about the culture. She knew the right words, understood the way of the times. She was actually from the people God told his people not to merge themselves with. Do you see how powerful that is? What does this say about the character of our Lord? How does someone who has no upbringing in the word of God, no evidence of the miracles of God, no personal experience with God end up being a descendant to Jesus himself? What if your life was meant to be a life where God seemed silent? Yet everything worked out on your behalf. Every promise you read in his word came true. Everything he said was yours manifested itself during your lifetime, all because of one choice. I wrote down, some of us are crippled by needing God to speak as if he couldn't move mountains with a simple thought on our behalf, as if he didn't write the story himself. We end up mad at him because we feel like he is silent or become crippled when we don't hear something back, thinking he can only make something happen if you receive a word, if I receive a word. I will, be, I will only be doing this right if I hear from him correctly. What does this result in? It results in fear and our capabilities, but it does not produce trust in his. I don't even know, I, always, I feel like I always say this, I don't even know if I fully understand what the Lord is even trying to communicate to me through this. It is no coincidence that I asked the Lord, really even in my time studying this, I asked the Lord, I was like, Lord, what do I even talk about next? I don't want to be this person that that is... Uh, stays up with the, the culture or the trends of social media. And there's been pressure at times that I've felt where I always need to have something to say. And the Lord reminds me, you speak when I tell you to speak because everything that I give you will be way more powerful than you ever speak in your, on your own authority. And so as I sat in silence waiting for him to say what to talk about next, in his command that he told me months ago, to read the Bible from the beginning, I somehow landed at Ruth. And then only did he open my eyes to the fact that he hadn't said anything. There was no word of the Lord from this, from this, uh, in this book. And then he begins to open my eyes to other things. It is not, even in this example, it's not even that. My desire, I want you guys to understand this and even myself. My desire was to seek the Lord on a matter. Lord, what do I record next? What do I film next? He didn't say anything. He gave me a command months ago that he knew would bring me to the, this exact moment in this exact time that I was reading Ruth. Only God can do that. I think in the stress of our lives, where we are constantly, you know, trying to perfect this relationship with God, sometimes we forget to rely on, on who He is. The Lord told me once that, Diana, I, I want you to know me so well that even if I do not speak, 
you won't fumble, you won't fall because you trust in the nature and the character of who I've shown you, of who I've said that I am to you, that you do not need me to speak in a situation. Rather, you will begin declaring who you know I am. And because of those declarations, the atmosphere would respond. I know many of us struggle with this. Some of us are those that we see the Lord speaking to other people and we're like, why won't he speak to me? We feel like something's wrong with us, like we're lacking, like there's some insufficiency within us. But all of that centralizes the focus on the fact that he hasn't spoken and not the truth of who he is. Is God faithful? Yes. Is he my provider? Yes. Is he faithful to guide me? Yes. He says in his word, I am the good shepherd. What does that mean for us? If he's already said it, does he need to repeat it? Do I need specific instructions in order to move forward in my life? Or could I just trust on who God is, even if he doesn't speak? I don't believe that it is a coincidence that we're given this story of Ruth, that her life was was literally used in such a powerful way. I mean, she, could you imagine being able to say, which I take that back. I was going to say, could you imagine being able to say that you were a descendant of Jesus? But we are. That you were of the line that birthed him. That's another whole thing. And she didn't even know. She had no idea that she was even doing that. When she met Boaz, it wasn't like she had this indicator that through our line, Obed and Jesse and David and so on, that, that the Messiah would be born. That I have the same blood running through me that will be deposited within him. Yet she was exactly where she needed to be. Connected to the exact person she needed to be connected to. And there was no and God said. I think this is just a beautiful testimony. That if you feel like you're in a place where you're desiring the word of the Lord and that you want to hear from him on a certain matter and he hasn't spoken or he hasn't given you clear direction or or clear guidance. Or maybe you're just that person who's like, God, I just want you to talk to me in general. I haven't heard anything from you. There's plenty that he's already said. But maybe you're looking for like a personal encounter with him, a personal experience. If that becomes the way in which the foundation of our relationship is laid with the Lord. It will always be faulty based on whether he is speaking or not, or whether our perception of him is that his voice is communicating with us or not. And the Lord told me, he said, Diana, you, I, I want to build you into a person that is so sure of who I am, that trust in, in my name, that you do not need me to speak on your behalf or tell you where to go because you trust that even in your going that I would align the things that are yours, that are meant for you, that have your name on it, that I would connect you to the right people for your purpose, that I would meet with you in the ways that I need to meet with you. The Lord is never in a hurry for us to know him. That is something that is mind blowing because we are in a rush to understand him so that we can. Yet, He doesn't just open the the eyes to our understanding all at once. We would literally explode. (laughs) And I I, I ask God this all the time. I'm like, God, just show me your face. Show me who you are. I want to know who you are. And he says, Diana, if I did that, you would die. Your humanity cannot handle the magnitude of the essence of God. And so in my goodness, I release, it's like a drip. Like I release to you things in the time that you need them so that you are able to see who I am so that it builds a foundation of trust so that in the moments when I do not speak or when you feel like you cannot hear me, you do not become you know, frantic or scrambled. There's no war within that tells you that you aren't or that you're lacking or that you're less than or that you're significant or that you can't understand or that you aren't able to perceive because he hasn't said something and he's talking to everyone else. He's moving in everyone else's life. In that moment, you can rest in the nature of who I am. And he gives us this example in Ruth of his character, that he never has to utter a word and his will comes to pass. There is so much power in this, you guys. (sighs) 
I ask the Lord all the time. It is one thing to be given a revelation of who he is. And it is a completely different thing to walk in the truth of that revelation. Then when it feels like God is still or when it, when it feels like I need direction from him, that I would quiet my soul and say, I trust in my God. He doesn't have to speak. Do you know how much faith that takes? To be in a situation where you are hanging in the balance and you're desiring an answer from God and he doesn't give you one. And you choose the next best thing. One choice from Ruth. By saying, I will not return to what I knew. I will not rely on my own understanding. I will not rely on my ability to make the situation work. I will not rely on it the way that I perceive this situation. I will not rely on my perception of God. Renew the way that I see you. One choice. And what's wild is that choice came to Ruth. I just realized this now. It wasn't like Ruth was scrambling all over Judah trying to find a husband so that she could be connected to God's people. A choice of Elimelech and Naomi to go to a foreign country is what allowed Ruth to have that choice. The choice was brought to her. Our God is bigger than us needing him to speak. It is good when he speaks and it reassures us. But we might be in transitions in our life where he's not talking as much or we don't hear him as, as much or we feel a little more disconnected. He said, Diana, you don't need an and God said from me. Reflect and trust me. You don't need me to tell you what to do in this situation. Reflect and trust me and do the next best thing. My heart is so heavy because I feel like I've been in that situation before. And I'm actually in that situation right now. And it can be so daunting. But the Lord says, be strong and of good courage. Reflect on who I am and trust me. I do not need a word. You do not need a word for my word to come to pass. The reason for that could be, I've said many times before, and the Lord has showed me this, that before we were formed, we were a conversation in the mind of God and the Trinity. And I fully believe that when he says that he knew you, that there were conversations that he had with you about your life. And that our lives are walking out that remembrance of who he is and that knowing of him before we took form. That there was conversation about you for this exact moment and this exact time in your life. Where he says, you don't need me to say anything because we've talked before. God always wrecks me in these. <laughs> we've talked before. This is the God we serve. This is the God who loves us, who encounters us, who chases after us, who pursues us. We don't have to feel like we're lacking just because he hasn't spoken to you. He's actually already had a conversation with you. And our life is just walking out of remembrance of that knowing from before you had blue hair, not blue hair, I was gonna say blue eyes and, and blonde hair.
He said, Gianna, you have to trust in who I am. It's not always about what I say, because I've already spoken. I wrote this down. If you were to decide not to speak for a whole month, would that make you less you? Would you not be able to accomplish things? Would all abilities come to a halt just because you decided not to speak for a month? How much more than with God? They said, this is true. You have to learn to trust in who I am, the essence of me, even if I never speak a word. This war that we face, this battle of, and God said, it's not easy. We desire to hear from the Lord. We want his reassurance, his affirmation, his commitment to us through his word. But there are moments when he would restrict a thing from us, not to drive us crazy or to make us insane, but so that we realize the revelation of who he is. I've never read the book of Ruth in this way before. Never seen it in this way. And yet the Lord is so faithful to reveal his character through his word. My desire for you is that you have peace from what was said today. What's crazy is it's not even that you may have an answer to the, the decision that you need to make or the guidance that you're, you're wanting from God or, or just wanting to hear from him in general. God, tell me something about me. Tell me something about who you are. I believe he's rising up an army of people who say, God doesn't have to speak. There was a conversation before time that he had with me, and I'm simply walking that out. He will be faithful to speak when I need it, and if he doesn't, I can trust in the nature of who he is. I can trust that my purpose, my destiny, my calling, the people that I need to be attached to will come to me in its proper timing. That's a different kind of faith, you guys. Wow. I don't, I don't know what more I need to say. <laughs> I'm kind of at a standstill because more even came out than I thought, but God does this every single time. It's... I feel like every time I'm just in awe and the Lord is like, Diana, we did this last, we did this last time. I always get so nervous and the, what the Lord shows me, I'm like, God, how do I communicate this that they'll understand? And he says, open your mouth that I would fill it. And he did today. And he gets all credit for what was said because I never understand how I sit down to teach a thing and he teaches me as I teach others. It's crazy. Anyways, I, I pray that you guys take this, what was said here today, and again, take it before the Lord. Always, always, always do that. You do not need me to confirm the word of the Lord to you. You don't need me to know him. This is just, if anything, a, a, a bridge, something that will propel you forward in your pursuit of him. Excuse me. I don't know why all this indigestion is happening right now, but I'm going to pray and uh, that the Lord would just bless what was done here. I think I said all I was supposed to say. And uh, I thank you guys for sticking with me for this long. If you have, uh, again, there's so many ways to uh, be in communion with the Lord. There's so much that he's done through my life in the places of the unknown. This, this whole book unraveled was written in the place of the unknown. I had no idea that I was even writing a book as I was writing it, but the Lord knew. He knew who it was for. He knew what the cover would look like. He knew all of that. I didn't even know it was a book. I thought I was just documenting things that were important. I knew it was. I needed to document it, but I thought it was for me. He said, it's for you, but it's also for hundreds of thousands of others. And uh, he's faithful in that way. Anyways, I pray that this blesses you. Um, I want to say this is episode seven in this series. So if you haven't gone back to watch any of the other ones, definitely go back and watch them. In all honesty, you can meditate on this for the next month. And I believe the Lord will meet with you as he opens your heart to things of him. 
my prayer for you is that whatever the Lord wants to do in your life, that you would remain soft to the things of Him. You don't need to know everything. You don't have to have read the entire Bible to know God. You don't have to have understood everything in the context to be able to, uh, you know, even communicate it to others. The Lord is bigger than that. And He's bigger than you needing a word from Him to move in your life, for you to see miracles, for you to experience healing, deliverance, for you to know that He's your provider and your good shepherd. He doesn't need to speak in order for you to experience that. And hopefully we become a people that trust in the essence of who he is instead of something that he does. Anyways, Lord, I love you and I thank you for the sacred time. You are so consistent to reveal yourself in this place. Lord, I didn't even know what I would be talking on on episode seven when you told me to start this series, yet every single time I have had encounters with you that I didn't even know I needed. It was a command, but you you granted a need inside of the instruction. I pray that this would bless the nations, that you would multiply it, that it would be a seed planted in the heart of the one that's listening right now, that you would give them rest and peace in who you are. Anything that comes, that arises, that, that, that shifts them into a place of fear, help them to be able to stop it in their tracks, in its tracks, and focus again on who you are. Help us to become a people who, who are able to discern what is not of you. We might not understand who you are fully, but we understand what is not you. Sometimes you show us what you aren't, so that we understand who you are. We love you, and I honor you for this. Thank you for glorifying yourself. Do you know that your people need you? We need the truth of who you are, and you do it every single time I open my mouth. You do it in the times where I'm afraid to open my mouth. And so I thank you for this place. I thank you for your love and for your compassion and your guidance, that you don't expect perfection from us, that you just want us to be in communion with you because you're granting a need that we have. I thank you for the exchange that you always are faithful to set before me when I just when I think it's about my perfection or, or doing or something like that. You remind me that you want to meet with me, that you want to encounter me, you want me to encounter you, this life is not about doing a checklist full of things for you. It's all about knowing who you are. That is our inheritance. I love you. And your name I pray, amen. To read my book Unraveled, tap the link in my bio or tap the link in the description. Love you, family.